So friends, Judge Tanya Chutkin just denied Donald Trump's motion, seeking to have her recuse herself or remove herself from presiding over Donald Trump's federal prosecution in Washington, D.C. for his democracy-busting crimes on and around January 6th. Let's talk about that because justice matters. Hey all, Glenn Kirshner here. So friends, Federal District Court Judge Tanya Chutkin just denied Donald Trump's motion seeking to have her remove herself from presiding over his prosecution in federal court in D.C. He's been indicted for four felony crimes, all involving his efforts to overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election, deny Joe Biden his rightful win, crimes that in a very real sense would have brought an end to our democracy, would have moved us in the direction of a dictatorship. Let's start with the new reporting concerning Judge Chutkin's ruling. Headline, Judge Tanya Chutkin won't recuse in Trump's election interference case. And that article begins, A federal judge overseeing former President Donald Trump's election interference case in Washington, D.C., has denied his request that she recuse herself from the case due to her prior comments in criminal cases against other January 6 defendants. U.S. District Court Judge Tanya Chutkin wrote in her opinion that her comments in other January 6 cases, which Trump's team took issue with, reflect the information and arguments presented by the defense in each case. Chutkin wrote that she has never taken the position the defense ascribes to it, that being to her, to the court, that former President Trump should be prosecuted and imprisoned. Trump is facing charges in four separate indictments. This case is one of two federal cases being prosecuted by special counsel Jack Smith, who was named in November 2022. So friends, it's worth working through just a few portions of Judge Chutkin's ruling, her order, her written opinion, because it's important reading. These words matter. So please bear with me for a few minutes and let's work through some of Judge Chutkin's ruling together. It is captioned, Memorandum, Opinion, and Order, And here's how it opens. Before the court is defendant's motion for recusal of district judge pursuant to 28 U.S.C. section 455, the applicable law. For the reasons set forth below, recusal is not warranted in this case and the court will deny the motion. And Judge Chutkin then sets it up with some background information. Defendant's motion relies on statements the court made during the sentencing hearings of two individuals convicted for their conduct on January 6, 2021. On that day, as the D.C. Circuit has described, a mob professing support for then-President Trump violently attacked the United States Capitol in an effort to prevent a joint session of Congress from certifying the electoral college votes designating Joseph R. Biden the 46th president of the United States. The rampage left multiple people dead, injured more than 140 people, and inflicted millions of dollars in damage to the Capitol. Then Vice President Pence, senators, and representatives were all forced to halt their constitutional duties, and flee the House and Senate chambers for safety. Over 1,000 people have been charged in this district with crimes related to their participation in the January 6th attack. While many of those cases are ongoing, hundreds have resulted in misdemeanor or felony convictions with sentences 
ranging from probation to years of incarceration. Dozens of January 6 defendants have appeared before and been sentenced by this court. And when Judge Chutkin says they've been sentenced by this court, that means that she presided over those cases, over those sentencing hearings. She is the one who sentenced those other January 6th defendants. And then Judge Chutkin goes on for several pages to discuss the two other sentencing hearings involving the two other defendants that she sentenced. During those sentencing hearings, she made certain statements, including addressing the arguments that those defendants made about the fact that others had not been charged, the organizers, the planners, the funders, the insiders, the, um, the hierarchy, the suits of the insurrection, that's my term, not hers. And she specifically mentions those arguments that are being made by those defendants and she comments about them and she puts them in context as, is, as she is required to do as the judge. She is required to address arguments that are raised by defendants in mitigation. In other words, arguments that they are offering and using to try to win lesser sentences. Judges are required to address those kinds of arguments before they pass sentence on the defendant. And that's what she does. She says nothing improper about Donald Trump or anybody else. She does nothing improper. And after she reviews her own comments in those two earlier sentencing hearings, Judge Chutkin goes on to talk about the importance of having a judge who is fair, impartial, independent, somebody whose judgment we the people can rely on. She talks about when recusal is appropriate and more importantly, when it's not. And here is just some of what Judge Chutkin says in that regard. Recusal requirements serve vital purposes. Unbiased, impartial adjudicators, in other words, judges, are the cornerstone of any system of justice worthy of the label. And because deference to the judgments and rulings of courts depends upon public confidence in the integrity and independence of judges, jurists must avoid even the appearance of partiality. But justice also demands that judges not recuse without cause. In the wrong hands, a disqualification motion is a procedural weapon to harass opponents and delay proceedings. If supported only by rumor, speculation, or innuendo, it is also a means to tarnish the reputation of a federal judge. Motions for recusal could also be wrongfully deployed as a form of judge shopping, permitting litigants or third parties to exercise a negative veto over the assignment of judges. There is, accordingly, as much obligation upon a judge not to recuse himself or herself when there is no occasion as there is for him or her to do so when there is. So friends, there you hear Judge Chutkin lay out the reasons for recusal, why it's necessary sometimes, but just as importantly, the reasons against recusal. And you heard some of those reasons it can be used as a procedural weapon to harass opponents, to delay proceedings. It can be deployed as a form of judge shopping. And that section of Judge Chutkin's written opinion is followed by a thorough, detailed survey of the law of recusal and the precedent, cases where judges were not required to recuse, and some pretty extreme cases where judges were required to recuse. And ultimately, here is Judge Chutkin's conclusion. This court has, from the beginning, repeated its commitment to ensure the orderly administration of justice in this case, as in any other. That commitment echoes the court's solemn oath 
to administer justice without respect to persons, to do equal right to the poor and to the rich, and to faithfully and impartially discharge and perform all the duties under the Constitution and laws of the United States. Based on its review of the law, facts, and record, the court concludes that a reasonable observer would not doubt its, meaning the court's, the judge's, ability to uphold that promise in this case. Words matter. Legal analysis matters. A thorough survey of the precedent, the law regarding when a judge should recuse, and as importantly, when a judge should not recuse, matters. It all matters. And as you may have heard me say before, friends, I know Judge Tanya Chutkin because I tried murder cases against Tanya Chutkin when she was a public defender for the District of Columbia. I was an assistant United States attorney for the District of Columbia. She was defending cases in D.C. Superior Court. I was prosecuting cases, and we tried cases against one another. And I can tell you, in my experience, albeit many years ago, Judge Chutkin, Tanya Chutkin, was a strong, smart, zealous, tactically savvy defense lawyer and advocate, zealous advocate for her client. And she was also trustworthy. She was a person of her word. She was honorable. She was ethical. And she was one hell of a public servant. And for those of you who don't know how the criminal justice system operates or how it's populated, Public defenders are every bit the public servants that prosecutors are, or that police officers are, or that judges are. You know, public defenders and criminal defense attorneys generally have one heck of a tough job because not only do they zealously represent the interests of their clients, clients who have been accused, charged, indicted, by, in a federal case, the United States of America, the federal government, but they also have to serve as a check against governmental overreach, misconduct, abuse. You know, I've always said defense attorneys have to do double duty, zealously representing their clients and making sure that prosecutors, police, and others who populate the criminal justice system haven't run roughshod over the rights of their client. It's a tough job. It's an important job, and it is a public service. And I can tell you firsthand, friends, as a defense attorney, Tanya Chutkin performed her public service extraordinarily well. And she continues to perform extraordinarily well as a judge, in my opinion. I've been in her courtroom recently when she was presiding over some of the January 6th cases. And, and I can tell you, friends, after reading this most recent order and written opinion by Judge Chutkin, she undoubtedly, undeniably made the right call. And she will preside over the criminal prosecution of Donald Trump for his democracy-busting crimes on and around January 6th. And that's a good thing for the American people because justice matters. Friends, as always, please stay safe, please stay tuned, and I look forward to talking with you all again tomorrow.